Welcome to Randy's Tropical Plants. Uh, looking a little rough today. I got a shiner from a surgery that I just recently had, but I wanted to get this video out. I haven't made one in a while. Today's video is going to be on ice cream bananas, which is a really great variety of banana, especially if you're in Florida. It's just a really productive, delicious banana, and I love them. Uh, but I'm going to be showing you the full size of the plant and the fruit and how I harvest the fruit, how I cut down the pseudo stem after it's done, I'm going to talk about general care that's not really going to be different from one banana to the next and I've talked a lot about it in the past I'll continue to talk about it in the future but anyway I hope you like the video thanks for coming this is a close-up of the bananas I don't know if it's going to capture it properly probably not but there's a lot of this white frost on the bananas and it builds up and builds up as they grow until they eventually kind of get this kind of frosty whitish blue color to them, which is why they're sometimes called blue java. In the tropics, they do this more than they do up here. But even up here, this one gets more frost than any other banana that I've ever grown. And I am about to harvest these. You can see that they're ready because they're all plump and rounded out. They're very much ready to harvest. You don't want to wait until they turn yellow before you harvest them. Some people say to let the oldest ones at the top turn yellow, like just start to turn yellow and then harvest them. I don't know, I've never actually done that. You don't need to. You can harvest them any time after they start to plump out like this. They're ready. So I just wanted to stand in front of the tree for a minute, give you a sense of the height of it. See, here's the bunch of bananas. Uh, this, is a, this is a sort of young corm, so this actually is the very first uh, pup. This was a little tissue culture clone that I bought, and it is now uh, about, I don't know, nine feet. It'll get more than that. As they get older, the corm gets bigger, the pseudostems will get taller, and this thing gets to about 12, maybe as much as 15 feet, but usually not that tall, usually about 12, 10 to 12 feet. So it's not a small variety, it's not the giant varieties that you can find too, but it's really not a good choice for container growing. Uh, up north, there's better choices than this, but uh, it's, a, it's a great banana for Florida, man. Bananas are parthenocarpic, which means that they will produce fruit regardless of whether or not they've been pollinated. So they'll have seedless fruit if they're not pollinated, but triploids like this one will always be seedless no matter what. And that's why they have to be reproduced asexually, either through meristem cloning or by cutting pups off of them. This is what makes bananas susceptible to diseases because you have these giant monoculture crops that are all genetically identical to one another. Uh, and so what the, the disease, that Panama disease that's killing all the bananas that I'm sure you've probably heard of if you're at all into bananas, it's actually a type of fusarium, which is the same thing that killed off the potatoes in Ireland during the potato famine. And they are specific to whatever it is that they attack and the banana fusarium is called Panama disease and it pops its head up every now and then and they have to come up with a new variety that it's not going to attack and that's what's going to happen and eventually they'll have more bananas. The, the banana industry isn't dying the way everybody says it is and there's thousands of different varieties of bananas out there and research stations are producing new ones all the time. But anyway, uh, that's kind of a, a, an aside rant. The reason that uh, we're, we're going to be talking about the, the, tri, the triploidy in this banana is because it has three sets of chromosomes. Two are from a, a Musa balbiciana, and one is from Musa acuminata. And so this is referred to as an ABB banana, acuminata, balbiciana, balbiciana. The Balbiciana crosses, the ABB bananas specifically, tend to be a little bit more cold tolerant than the triple acuminatas, which are sort of like the Cavendish group bananas, are all triple acuminatas. They have three sets of chromosomes from Musa acuminata. Uh, they tend to be a little bit, these guys, the hybrids, tend to be a little bit tougher, at least the ABBs do. I've had issues with the AABs, like the true plantains and the rhino horn and things like that. They do okay for me, but these ABBs are really tough here in Florida. They do really, really well. They don't require a lot of care. Uh, I particularly like them. I've got three. Uh, there's this one, which is ice cream or blue java. Then I also have saba and I also have namwa. The problem with them is none of them are small. Uh, they get pretty big. They all have absolutely delicious bananas though. But 
when you see a banana that says, you know, AAA or A, you know, triple A or ABB or AAB or BBB, that's what they're referring to is what chromosomes they have. So this is an ABB banana and I, I particularly love the ABBs. So the information that I'm going to give you right now is pretty much generic to all bananas, more or less. Um, the light requirements and soil requirements and watering requirements, food, don't change much from one to another because most of them are really all the same species or a mixture of the same two species. Actually all of my bananas are either Musa cuminata triploids or Musa cuminata Balbistiana hybrids, with the exception of one, which I've got one uh, fey banana, which is uh, Musa troglodytiforum, I believe is the species name. But I just started growing that one. So really, uh, some of them are a little bit more cold sensitive than others, but that's really the main difference between them. So in terms of light, bananas like full sun. I don't know, for some reason, I come across a lot of people that think that bananas are a shade plant. They are not a shade plant. They like full sun. Uh, they will get torn up by wind, so if you're in a windy spot, you need to plant them someplace where they will be have some, some kind of a wind screen, otherwise they'll just be torn up all the time. Bananas need, uh, they like warm, humid climate, and so if you can't provide that, they're going to not do as well. They can survive outside of, of the tropics. I've got actually uh, a Namwa growing in Oakland, California that's doing okay. And it's pretty cold there most of the time. So, you know, they, they, they can survive outside of an I ideal environment. They're just not going to do as well. And they're not going to grow as fast. They're not going to produce as much fruit. Um, but I always encourage people to try. But having said that, freezing temperatures will burn them. And there are some species of bananas like uh, Musa Bosju. There's one, I don't remember the species name, but the, the cultivar is Mekong Giant. If you live someplace where there's snow and frost and freeze, you can grow both of those uh, amazingly well. But if you were to try to grow these there, even if you were to really protect them and cover them, everything above ground is going to die when it gets below, very seriously below freezing. And you might be able to keep the corm alive. The problem is, is that you're never going to really get any fruit because in order to get fruit, you've got to let this thing last until next season. So I've got one back there that I'm going to leave on until next year. That's going to be my fruiting one next year. This one I'm cutting off. I'm cutting off this bunch of bananas today. I'm cutting this banana all the way down to this, uh, sorry, this pseudo stem all the way down to the ground. I'm cutting off all of these pups with the exception of one largest one in the back. And I'll show you what that looks like when it's all done. Um, but that one in the back is probably not going to bloom. Hopefully not until around May of next year. If it blooms towards the end of this growing season, those bananas are going to be a loss. The further north you are, the harder that's going to be. You're going to run into that problem more and more. Even if you do get uh, a nice bloom on your banana, if it's the wrong time of year, if it's way too early in the year or way too late in the year, it's going to get, get through a cold snap. That, banana, that uh, bunch of bananas is going to stop growing and they don't always start again. Once they get kind of uh, a hitch in their stride, they don't, they don't develop properly and you won't get a good rack of bananas out of that particular pseudo stem. And this happens to me a lot. Every single year I lose two or three racks of beautiful bananas on, I've got 10 different varieties of bananas now, and I always lose bananas every year. It's just part of growing bananas in Tampa, Florida. You try to do that in an even colder environment, it's going to be a bigger and bigger problem. This is not an issue for people in Puerto Rico or Jamaica or Hawaii. They harvest bananas all year long and it's, it's always a, a, a perfect climate for them, more or less. So so uh, keep that in mind if you're trying to grow outside of an ideal environment for them. I get a lot of people coming at me with questions on how to grow them in New York and in Michigan. You're going to have to grow them indoors. You're going to have to have light all year long. If you, you want to try to like winter them in your basement, like some people do that, you can kind of get away with that. You're just not ever going to get fruit. And if you don't care, I would say don't grow a fruiting variety. You know, it's, it's kind of a waste of your time. Grow um, Musa Bosju because you'll have a big, beautiful plant that can withstand all kinds of fruits. You don't even have to remove them. I mean, there's people growing those in Canada, you know? Um, but having said that, I always encourage people to try. I, you know, when I lived in, in California, I was growing bananas way outside of what would be a good environment for them. It got way colder there than it does here where I was living. Um, 
I always encourage people to try. I mean, and if you want me to sell you a banana, I will, but I'll also tell you whether or not I think it's going to succeed. This would not be a good variety for people up north. Um, it's a delicious banana, it's a beautiful plant, but it's just not, it's not the best choice. You should stick with a super dwarf that you can bring inside and grow in a bright window and grow as a house plant, put it outside in the summertime. That's your best bet. Uh, truly tiny. Uh, there's one called Dwarf Novak, which is a, supposed to be a pretty good one. I've never grown. Um, anyway, uh, that's, that's climate, you know. Warm humidity, uh, bright sunshine, that's what they love. When it comes to water, uh, bananas can take some drought. They've got a corm underground, which I've shown in older videos. It's like a giant. If you haven't seen those ones, go back and watch a couple of my older videos. But underground here is a giant potato-like tuber that is, it's, a, it's stem tissue, but it acts as a, a reservoir for water and nutrients, and so the banana can actually withstand a, cer a cer certain amount of drought. And they can store nutrients, so even when the soil gets, so soil gets poor, and they, because they will extract the nutrients out of the soil, trust me, uh, if your soil is not real good, they can, they can sort of survive on that corn for a while. But you don't want to do that. You want them to have a regular source of water. You want them to have a regular source of nutrients. So, uh, in the rainy season in Florida where I'm at, I, I don't have to water. We get rain most afternoons, and so the soil never completely, completely dries out in the summertime, which is perfect. That's exactly what you want. Uh, in the wintertime it does, and that's okay because this plant here in this climate starts to stop growing once the night temperatures hit about 55. When it starts getting below that, they just kind of stop growing. They won't die or get burned or damaged until you get down towards freezing or below freezing for sure. But between freezing and mid 50s at night, when the temperatures are those those temperatures, they don't really grow. They kind of go into a quasi dormancy. So I don't feed them at all during that period of time, and I don't water them at all during that period of time. In the spring here, it's hot and dry-ish. Like the humidity is much lower than it is in the summertime, and so I actually they start to grow because the temperatures come up. I start watering them almost every day during that period of time just to give them a kick start so that they're really doing well by the time the rainy season comes along. And, but you sort of don't have to, but they'll be way better off if you do. It's at that time that I also start to feed them. Now, I, in my older videos, I talked about a fertilizer that I used that was 6212. That was what I used to use. Um, I was buying that from a banana nursery. It was kind of expensive. I figured out ways of making that same ratio of granular fertilizer for bananas, but it was kind of complex and I had to use a, multiple things to mix together. So instead of doing that, I found a really cheap and easy way, and I'm going to make another video on that specifically, I'm actually showing you what I do, but it's really easy. I just buy 10-10-10 from a feed store, it's made for vegetable gardens, and I mix that with, uh, wait until the truck goes by. I mix that 10, 10, 10 with, uh, it's 0, 0, 060, which is uh, potassium sulfate, which is sulfate of potash is what it's sold as. And both products are pretty cheap. I mix them at a two to one ratio, two times two parts of the 10, 10, 10 to one part of the potassium sulfate. And that comes out to 6.7, 6.7, 26.7, or 7, 7, 27 if you want. So for that mixture of fertilizer, I use one pound of that granular fertilizer per month on this during the growing season. During the winter, when it's not growing, I don't use any fertilizer at all. One thing I wanna mention really quickly is I get a lot of questions about whether or not to cut this off. This is the flower head. This is just producing, these are flower bracts, this is producing nothing but male flowers at this point. So a lot of people will cut this off. They'll cut it off usually when it's like right about here or so. They'll cut it off and they'll just let the bunch of bananas develop. And the thinking is that if it doesn't have the flower growing at the bottom, that 
all of the energy will go to growing the bananas. Now, I've had other people, like this one Jamaican guy I used to know, he insisted, he referred to this as the mother nipple. The mother nipple is supposedly what is, it's drawing energy down from the plant and that this is then getting energy as it's going past. And so like that's a, a completely different school of thought on whether or not to cut the flower head off. Now, I've tried it both ways, and I can tell you with great certainty from my experience, and this is purely anecdotal experience, that whether you cut it off or leave it on, they're gonna develop either way. And you're gonna get a decent rack of bananas either way, as long as the plant is healthy and happy, that the amount of food and water and light and everything that it's getting has way more to do with whether or not you get big, fat, delicious bananas than whether or not you cut the inflorescence while it's still growing. Um, you can eat this. A lot of, like most Americans don't know that. All the people from India and other places are like, yeah, no, duh, it's delicious. Um, it's a lot of work to prepare. I've never actually done it. I've eaten it before. It's not bad. And you know, in, it's usually in a curry or something where it tastes like big surprise curry, but it's still uh, an edible vegetable. And I see them for sale sometimes in Asian markets as well. So uh, if you are growing bananas, that's just one thing to think of. You can, you can actually eat these if you learn how to do it. I, again, don't really know how. But I'm about to cut this whole thing off, and then I'm going to hang them up, and I'll show you uh, how I do that. I just basically hang the whole thing upside down. So this is the rack. I'm actually standing in front of a different banana that I've got. This is a red dwarf, but these are ice cream bananas. Nice haul. So they're here hanging in my living room. I think the, the light quality here is pretty terrible. Uh, I apologize for that, but so I've just got them on a piece of clothesline hanging from this screw eye in the ceiling, which I leave there all the time for this purpose. And so, yes, I frequently have bananas hanging in my living room. When these start to turn yellow, I'll just start eating them right off of the bunch. I'm actually going to cut some of these off uh, as individual hands, and I'm going to be giving those away to some of my friends. Jealous. So there seems to be a lot of confusion as to what to do at this point with the banana plant. And there's a lot of confusion as to what a banana plant is and how they grow. I've actually made a video about that, so uh, go, a bit, go ahead and watch that. But I'm going to show you how, what I'm going to do right now with this. And this particular pseudostem is not going to grow anymore. It's not going to bloom again. It's never going to grow another leaf. It's just going to sort of slowly die and get in the way and kind of get in the way of the light of the ones that I want to grow here. So I use this beautiful uh, machete right here and I'm going to start cutting up here just to get some of this slop off of there and then I'm going to start cutting it down like one segment at a time. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. So now I've gotten about as much of it as I need to get off of it. I'm going to start cutting these pups off of here. And to do that, I'm going to dig them out and I'm going to cut them off in a very specific way so that I can grow them. So that was ice cream banana. Uh, I hope it was uh, informative. I hope I gave you all the information you need. 
if I didn't answer any questions that you're specifically coming here to, to get the information for, please leave questions below. Negative comments I'm not going to respond to, but if you ask me a question, I'll respond. You can either ask in the comment section below or below there's also a link to my website where you can get to my email. That's actually the best way to contact me. But either way, I'll, I'll get back to you and I'll give you the information that you ask for if I can. And uh, thank you if you're one of my subscribers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna be hitting 10,000 subscribers really soon. That's amazing to me. I, I, I remember the first time I got one subscriber, it was almost a year into doing this. I got my first subscriber and I'm about to hit 10,000, which for some YouTubers, that's really small. But for me, I'm really grateful for that and for all of you. So thank you so much for coming to my videos and I hope that I help you and I'm gonna continue to make more videos. So please keep coming back.